Thanks very much for that kind introduction. The one fact you left out is actually, when I was at Caltech and WashU, I was David Van Essen's postdoc. <laughs> so everything I know about the brain, I learned from David. Um, and I love coming to uh, engineering conferences, especially student engineering conferences, because of my particular bias in neuroscience, which is that understanding the brain is basically just a big, ugly, complicated reverse engineering problem. So uh, here's a, a, our problem. We want to understand this computer over here. And uh, we don't really know a heck of a lot about it. I mean, we've got hundreds of years of stuff, but you know, information and data, but there's still a lot we don't know. Uh, but for comparison, we can think of this computer over here, which is a standard i486 CPU, a few, few years old now. Uh, so uh, there are several systematic differences between these. This system's gone through about eight generations of uh, design, intentional design by humans. This has gone through about 25,000 generations of evolutionary design, at least since the human lineage, human lineage broke off. Um, the parts for this system are known and clear because it was designed this way, so we know there are some graphics registers and some memory registers and all kinds of specific kinds of subsystems in the CPU chip, and we know where they are, and somebody put them there, and they do a specific job. And here, there's a bunch of parts. We don't really know what they are. As David pointed out, Broadman kind of divided it up into parts based on, on um, course anatomy, and you can use other methods for dividing it into parts, but what the parts are is kind of complicated and mysterious. Um, we know how information flows through this network because it was designed with a certain language and a certain word order and clear bits and uh, 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 essentially pathways of information flow to find, uh, defined by information theory. And uh, over here we don't know what the language is at all. I'm a neurophysiologist by training so I assume that everything's basically encoded in spikes but who really knows? It could be some other mysterious thing going on in there. Uh, and um, basically this problem if you wanted to reverse engineer it, it would be at least tractable. It would be really hard, but you can imagine this is a, a fairly simple design system um, that, is, that is available, that is designed by very specific structured uh, <coughs> rules. And this system is designed by evolution, and there may be a lot of dead ends and sort of extra cruft in there that's not even all that useful. It's just how the system ended up working because, you know, it's an evolved system. It's not going to be optimized. Generally, it's going to be optimized down the sort of branch of the tree that it's on. And here we could sort of analyze this system for as long as we want. This system, usually we only have for a very finite amount of time. We can't get that much data from it. So this is a really hard problem. 
Essentially, this is a, a reverse engineering a nonlinear dynamical system. And for those of you in engineering, you know that uh, if you have a linear system, the world is wonderful, easy to solve. Nonlinear system, well, kind of a pain, but you can solve it. Nonlinear dynamical system, well, everybody just throws up their hands and gives up, right? People can't even get the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning right in this room. And uh, you can imagine what it's like trying to, trying to reverse engineer this brain. I mean, we don't even have math to describe what this thing does. So it's a hard problem. Uh, now, there's really two aspects of this problem because the brain is a, a very special kind of computer. This is something that was drilled into me by David and Charlie Anderson. Um, the brain is not like a regular computer. A regular computer, you have hardware and you run software on it and you run whatever software you need on your computer platform. But the brain is a hardware computer. In the short term, the wires are fixed. You can't change them. It takes about a half an hour to grow a new synapse. So you can only work with the hardware you have, and therefore the computations that the brain is performing have to be determined ultimately by the connections, and hence David's fascination and interest with the connections of the brain. But the problem is, as David so eloquently pointed out, is that we don't have very good ways to measure the connections of the brain, and uh, we're not going to get them anytime soon. So our connectional information is going to be coarse, and we're never going to know, say, you know, exactly what all the synapses are in the human brain anytime soon or exactly what the biophysical mechanisms are for different types of synapses. And all those factors matter for function. So my uh, contention would be rather than just looking at connection, we need to combine connection information with functional information. And of course, measuring function in the human brain is also hard because we can't just take humans apart and do anything we want with them like we can with, say, a simpler model system. So uh, right now, the met best method by far we have of measuring uh, activity, functional activity in the human brain is uh, magnetic resonance imaging that David talked about. Now, um, I know many of you do MRI, but I'll just give the two sentence version. Uh, basically, this is a big gigantic stationary magnet. You slide somebody in the stationary magnet, it aligns some vanishingly small fraction of the protons in their brains, and then you apply a radio frequency pulse, knock the protons off axis, and as they precess back down, they give off their radio frequency energy, and you can measure that. And that's coded digitally, so you can essentially get a digital information about the location of these protons relaxing in the brain. And it turns out by some biological quirk, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have slightly different paramagnetic signals, and so we can sort of get some proxy for uh, brain activity due to blood oxygenation and deoxygenation with MRI. But these signals are pretty complicated and indirect, right? Because really we're looking at the plumbing. We're looking at the plumbing of the system, not neurons. In fact, there's nothing even close to neurons in functional MRI signals that we measure. Um, First of all, they're very indirect. Here's a neuron. There's a presynaptic membrane and a postsynaptic membrane. This neuron sends some neurotransmitter over to the postsynaptic cell. Now, you can't leave the extra neurotransmitter here in the synaptic cleft, otherwise you become paralyzed. So you've got this vacuum cleaner system that's astrocytes that surround the cleft. They take up the neurotransmitter. They repackage it and deliver it back to the presynaptic cell. And as a side effect, they have these little philopodia on the capillaries, and the astrocyte absorbs neurotransmitter and says, oh, somebody around here fired, so I better open my philopodia because they're going to need oxygen and sugar from the bloodstream. And then the capillaries get larger, and then blood flow, blood volume increase in this uh, capillary, and the oxygen extraction changes over time in the venous system. So we're not measuring the brain, we're measuring this bold signal, blood oxygen level dependent signal, and we're measuring blood vessels. In general, uh, we measure blood vessels in MRI. The blood vessels that have the highest signal to noise are the blood vessels that are about the same size as a voxel. So in a typical functional MRI experiment, we're talking about voxels two by two by two millimeters. So most of our signal is gonna come from blood vessels about two millimeters across. Now, uh, two millimeters is kind of a big volume, and you might realize if you're a neurobiologist that that's actually a hyper column. This is the ice cube model of V1. We've got uh, ocular dominance columns, orientation columns, and these are arranged in a grid in a retinotopic map. And a collection of orientation columns and hyper columns together, uh, orientation columns and ocular dominance columns, is called a hyper column. And the resolution of MRI is even coarser than a hyper column. So we're not going to be able to get fine scale information. We're going to be able to get information that's pooled over a couple million neurons and indirectly coupled to those neurons through this hemodynamic response. And this hemodynamic response is fairly slow. If we uh, show a checkerboard in a little small regions, wedges here, um, and we look at a few checkerboards, these colored ones here, we look at the time course of the response in voxels uh, sensitive to those checks, 
you can see that some of the checks elicit a positive bold response, some of them elicit a negative bold response, but there's about a four second delay between when the check is flashed and the bold response. And that's because plumbing is really, really slow. So this is a very slow, very indirect measure, uh, method of measuring the brain. The way, uh, the analogy I often give is imagine you have this weird job where somebody tells you to go in and figure out what's going on in an office building. And the natural way to do this would be you go in and you talk to everybody in the office building and say, what do you do? What's your job? But instead of doing that, you decide, no, you go into the kitchen and you figure out how much water they're using. Because you figure if people are working hard, they're probably going to be making more coffee and they're going to be using more water. And so if the water's flowing more, that floor of the office building is probably doing more work. That's essentially the, the thing we're doing in MRI. And if you do some back-of-the-envelope calculations about how much information you get out of MRI, uh, in the best case scenario, you're getting about one one millionth of the information that's available in the brain at any given point in time. But that sounds bad, but remember, there's a lot of neurons in the brain. So even one one millionth is a huge amount of information. And the amazing thing about MRI uh, is that this technique works way better than any other method we have for measuring brain activity, and that you can get out a huge amount of information, even though this is very indirect. So let's look at the kind of information we get out of the brain. Here's a movie on the left and a brain activity on the map, kind of like on the right, kind of like David showed. Uh, now the brain is crunched up inside the skull, which is very inconvenient. And one of the first things David taught me is don't look at it crunched up inside the skull, flatten it out. So here we have a flat map of the brain. Um, on here, red means bore, bold. Uh, blue means less bold. Bold is always a relative signal, not an absolute signal. And uh, in the back here, this is the visual system. This is the front of the brain. This is the top and the bottom. So you can see that uh, we are getting systematic changes in brain activity while people watch this movie. All they're asked to do in this task is watch the movie and fixate on a small green spot, which is not drawn on here except with my laser pointer. So they're passively watching this movie. And as the movie plays, you see changes in bold signal over time, mostly in the back of the brain here in the visual system, which is kind of what you'd expect. This is, after all, a movie. But you also see changes in bold up here in the front, even though the person's not actually doing a task, and up here in sort of the motor somatosensory strip, very subtle changes, a lot up here in parietal, and some changes down here in auditory cortex. So you can think of the problem of trying to reverse engineer the brain at a functional level as trying to find a systematic mapping or relationship between these movies and these brain activity signals. That's all you're trying to do. It's basically a regression problem. Now, uh, on here we can measure about 30,000 individual points using a typical 3T bold. Uh, so uh, we're going to build 30,000 potentially models. Each model is going to tell how an individual point in the brain maps onto this movie. In other words, what features in this movie drive responses at each individual point. And then, of course, these individual voxels and volumetric pixels are aggregated into areas, like V1 is going to have maybe three or 5,000 of these points. So all of the neurons in V1 are probably coding in some common space, and all of the voxels in V1 should code in some common space. So you're going to need a, a common model for V1, and you'll have an individual model for each voxel. And then if you pick another area, like V2, you'll have a common model for V2 and an individual model for each voxel. Now, what do those models look like? Well, in general, all you really know is that they're nonlinear because there's no point in having a completely linear brain. If you have a linear brain, then you might as well just look at the pixels because you're not going to get any more information after all linear transformation is just a rotation of the coordinate system. So what the brain has to do is apply nonlinearities to the input so that it can extract information that's implicit in the input and make it explicit so that it can be read out. And of course, also the brain has to combine current information with prior information it has about the world in order to optimize learning and optimize behavior. So uh, if you're measuring one point in the brain, you, a bold response, you start with a stimulus, you want to find the relationship between the stimulus and the bold response. One way you can think of this is uh, what I call linearizing the problem. You can find a nonlinear mapping from the stimulus into some feature space such that the relationship between the feature space and the bold response is linear. And this is actually a convenient way to think about the problem because then you can essentially come up with a theory about the nonlinear mapping, implement that theory by deterministically moving the stimulus from the stimulus space into the feature space, and then using regression to map the feature space representation of the stimulus onto the bold responses. And the nice thing about doing regression in this particular case is it's going to be linear regression. And of course, linear regression is one of those things we can do really well. Now, uh, once you have a model that you're happy with by criteria that I'll explain in a second, if you're interested in it, you can do decoding. And in decoding, you take all the bold responses across a bunch of voxels. Uh, these, are, these all have models, so you can now linearly map those models 
back into the feature space, and then if you so desire, you can nonlinearly map back into the stimulus space and reconstruct the stimulus. And these are symmetric problems. The encoding and the decoding problems are related by Bayes' theorem. Essentially, the encoding model gives you the likelihood the probability of response given a stimulus, you multiply this times a prior on the stimulus, and you get a posterior over the responses, the posterior over the stimuli, uh, the probability of each stimulus eliciting a response. And so now you have encoding and decoding in the same framework. Now there are, if somebody wants to know later, there are specific reasons it's better to build an encoding model than a decoding model, but for this talk it's not really important. So the the problem here is this is a large-scale data analysis problem because we have 30,000 voxels and we don't know what model is appropriate for each voxel. So uh, we can take a data set, here's a stimulus and here's a response, we take a bunch of responses and we can uh, break these responses into two parts, an estimation data set that we're going to use to train the model and a validation data set that we're going to use to test the model. And then for each individual voxel, we can start fitting models. So we might have a hypothesis. Say, I think this voxel is sensitive to edges. So I'm going to transform my stimuli into an edge map, and then I'm going to find a set of weights that map this voxel's responses onto the edge map. Essentially, that will tell me what edges this voxel cares about. And then I can try a different model. Well, maybe, it's a maybe this voxel cares about semantics. So I'm going to take uh, semantic information that occurs in this picture, these words actually don't occur in this picture because I changed the picture, forgot to change the words. Uh, but uh, anyway, now I'm going to have a set of weights that map these words into this voxel. And so I can get, fit multiple models to each voxel. Now I have to test which model is right for each voxel. So to do that, I go over to my validation data set and I get predictions from my model, say the edge model, and I just correlate them with the observed responses in that voxel and I can compare the predictions from my edge model to my semantic model to my attention model, say, or however many models I want for each voxel. And I can do this as many times as I want because I'm not overfitting, I'm saving data out to do this. This is a large scale data fitting problem. We're gonna fit dozens of models to 30,000 individual voxels. And of course, the thing to remember is, if there's, say, as David implied, but didn't state something like 300 distinct human brain areas, then we're going to need 300 model types distributed over 30,000 individual voxels. So there's going to be a lot of modeling going on. All right, I'll skip this. Okay, to make a long story short, let's just think about vision for the time being, and I'm going to just demonstrate a few classes of models that will give you an idea of how this framework works. We're going to focus on vision because it's the easy part of the brain. Everything, vision is hard, but everything else is much harder than vision. Vision is the dumbest part of the brain. So um, it turns out that people have done a lot of other MRI experiments um, that uh, have identified certain regions of interest or areas. These are usually done by subtraction. For example, you might show somebody some faces and then show somebody some places and subtract the bold activity and locate the places on the cortical surface that actually have more of a response to faces and places. And if you do that, you get these white lines. You can see there's a whole bunch of white lines. These white lines are retinotopic areas. This is the perihippocampal place area that likes places. This is the fusiform face area. It likes faces. This is the extrastrite body area. Uh, there's some auditory areas, some frontal eye field areas, there's a bunch of areas. People have parceled out the brain using these functional localizers to uh, a reasonable, modest extent. Uh, there's a whole bunch of parts of the brain, of course, we don't know what they do. Uh, there are no functional localizers that really give you anything clear at all. And we don't know that these functional localizers are actually, are actually correct. I mean, if you use a functional localizer where you show faces and places, and your area that you're recording from is actually the kumquat area, and really it prefers kumquats. Well, maybe faces just look more like kumquats, so it looks like a face area to you, but really it's a kumquat area. It's a problem with localizers. Okay. So it turns out there's two broad families of models that you can fit to the brain. Uh, one is structural models and one is semantic models. And structural models are models that essentially go from the stimulus space into some feature space using a mathematical algorithm that you can understand. For example, an edge map or a spatial frequency map. Semantic models go from the feature space into a semantic space, usually through some transformation that you don't really understand. And I'll explain why that is later. And you can see that these are distributed differently over the brain. The structural models model well early visual areas like V1, V2, V3, and the semantic models model well, model well these higher order visual areas like PPA and FFA and so on. And so uh, I'm gonna show you each of these models and how they were kind of fit to the data. So uh, this is a structural motion energy model. This turns out to be the best model for early human vision that we have right now, um, that anybody has. 
And uh, the model works thusly. We start with our input, our movies, and we have some bold responses that we're trying to predict. So for each and every voxel, we fit a model. And the model actually has two stages. The first stage is essentially a latent variable neural model that's meant to model an underlying population of neurons that we don't actually have access to. And the second stage is hemodynamic coupling terms that describe the relationship between these virtual neurons that we didn't measure and the bold responses that we actually measured. Now, there's a bank of about two to 8,000 of these motion energy filters. They vary in their spatial frequency, their orientation, their position, their phase, and their direction. And each motion energy filter is actually a cascade. We start uh, by stripping off color. Uh, we take a spatiotemporal Gabor wavelet. We multiply it times the input. Uh, we take two of these in quadrature phase and combine them to get a complex cell, model complex cell. We uh, stick in a compressive nonlinearity because it helps predictions. And then we temporally downsample from the rate of the movies, which in this experiment was 30 hertz, to the rate of the bold, which in this experiment was actually only a half hertz. So now, this, remember, is deterministic. This has nothing to do with our data. This is essentially a theory about an underlying neural population. So it's completely deterministic from the input, but it is a nonlinear transformation. Now we have a bank of two to 8,000 filters, and for each individual filter, for each feature channel, we fit a six-tap uh, finite impulse response hemodynamic filter. So we're fitting essentially two to 8,000 of these six-tap filters, and we take the sum of those to predict the bold responses. Now this is a, a really large-scale fitting algorithm because you have to do this for each one of the 30,000 voxels that you measured, but this is kind of what our lab's bread and butter is, so we have uh, a lot of software for solving this kind of problem. Now once you fit this model, your first question should be, well, how well does it predict? And uh, so you can just take a separate data set that you saved and look at predictions. This shows predictions of the motion energy model. You notice it predicts well here in the back of the brain. And if we compare that to, say, a local change model that doesn't have direction or motion, that model doesn't work so well. Uh, a static model that doesn't have motion works even worse. And this is a face model that's just pathetic. It's not even worth thinking about. So, so this motion energy model works really well for early vision, which was exactly what it was designed to do. Uh, now, it's always entertaining to think, well, what do these voxel models look like? After all, you're measuring from a million neurons, and you've got 8,000 features. Does it make any sense at all? Well, you can treat a voxel like a neuron and look at its voxel-wise receptive field. So here's the receptive field for one voxel. Um, it's located here in the spatial, uh, spatial display. And now we can marginalize out um, the excitatory channels and the suppressive. Ch well, these aren't really excitatory and suppressive. These are more like um, positive bold and negative bold. And uh, we can look at orientation channels and phase channels and aggregate frequencies together. And you can see that there's a lot of substantial uh, weights in this matrix. There's 8,000 basis functions here, and a lot of them has positive weights. And you can't really tell what the tuning is from this. Uh, and you kind of expect that. After all, we are aggregating information over millions of neurons. So uh, to make this a little clearer, you can marginalize out say spatial frequency and temporal frequency. So on the left here is a receptive field for one neuron. You can see that we, uh, this has high sp spatial frequency and low temporal frequency tuning. Here's a different neuron with high spatial frequency and medium temporal frequency tuning. And you notice that we can get, we can recover temporal frequency tuning at our temporal frequency rate far higher than the sampling rate of the bold response. And that's because we have this underlying neural model. So to make a long story short, basically you can do this one experiment and recover pretty much everything anybody's ever reported in any MRI experiment in human V1, just by using natural movies in this, this model. This move model basically accounts for every previous report. Uh, how well does this model work? Well, one thing you can do is to look at predictions. Another thing you can do is do movie identification. So in this case, we have uh, 400 movie clips. These are one second long. And we interrogate the model to figure out if it can figure out which of these 400 movie clips that it actually saw. And it does this by just looking at the bold response and then running the model backwards and trying to figure out which clip was most likely uh, the one that elicited that bold response. And you can see that the model's doing almost perfect. We're, we're up about, uh, I don't know, 90 something ridiculous percent correct. And if we increase the number of candidate movies in the clip to say 10 to the sixth, we're still well above 80 percent. So, with 10 to 6 movie clips, we can tell at 80% accuracy exactly which movie clip you saw in a one second uh, time window. That's, that's a pretty impressive result, I think, especially considering we're measuring the plumbing and not neurons. So I told you about some structural models. They fit well, or a structural model, it fits well in all these early areas. And I'd like to move on to a semantic model that fits well in these higher areas. Now there's a problem with semantics, and that's uh, not the fault of neuroscience, that's actually the fault of computer vision. 
So computer vision algorithms are pretty good at finding the local structural features in an image. But there's no computer vision system out there that could say, look out at this room and just label all the things in this image. Or look up at me and label all the things. You know, there's a slide projector over here, there's a whiteboard, there's a picture behind me, there's me, there's a microphone. No computer vision system can do that. So we don't really have a way to transform these images directly into semantic information. We have to instead essentially do this by hand, which I consider cheating, but there's really nothing to, no, no other way around this right now. So we need a semantic space that we want to use for this. And the semantic space we decided to use was something called WordNet. WordNet is a semantic tree of uh, about 80,000 nouns and verbs in the English language. And it essentially uh, recapitulates the is a relationships between nouns and verbs. So at the root of WordNet, this, is, this actually just shows the 1,700 most common nouns and verbs. There's a main tree here that has three branches and some subtrees for the verbs. And these are is relationships, so the base of all the nouns is thing. And then you can see that all these things are artifacts. And here's furniture, here's cars, here's indoor scenes, outdoor scenes. Uh, here's kind of things you can pick up. Uh, here's people, here's animals, and so on. So, so this gives us kind of a, a hierarchical semantic tree that we can work with that's a convenient space and has been validated with English language and perceptual psychology. So how do we fit this data to our, our uh, stimulus? Well, we have to do this by hand. So you take a one second movie clip and you find all the nouns and verbs in that movie clip. So you say, oh, I think there's a dog in the movie clip. And then uh, because there's a dog, I know there's a canine, which is a subordinate category, and I know there's an animal. And I think there's a woman in this clip, and I know there's an adult, and I know there's a person. And then I'll go to a different clip. Well, there's a jaguar, which means there's a feline, an animal, a, uh, an organism, and an object, and so on. You can do this for all the movie clips in the stimulus, which uh, if you want to see a graduate student become very unhappy, this is a quick way to do it. But he designed this, so he has only himself to blame. This is uh, Alex Hoof. Um, so uh, we now have two hours of natural movies, and we've essentially nonlinearly transformed these movies into an indicator uh, matrix, where we've got a row for each of the 1,700 nouns and verbs, and a column that indicates whether that noun or verb is present in that one second uh, cube of space time. <clears throat> so now we can do regression between every single voxel and this matrix. We take our voxel's bold response, we shove it through the same regression procedure we used earlier. Um, in general, these are MRI data. They've all been sphered. They're Gaussian, so usually ridge regression is the thing you use for this. Uh, and then you're going to get a finite impulse response that indicates the hemodynamic coupling for each individual noun and verb that happens in the movies and what the hemodynamic response is of that voxel to those nouns and verbs. Now you can interrogate a single voxel. So these are two different voxels from two different brain areas, uh, the right precunus and the left parahippocampal place area. Let's look at this first. Uh, red here means a more bold response than average, and blue means a lower bold response than average. And the size of the ball just indicates the magnitude of the bold response. So I've labeled some subset of these so you can kind of get an idea for, for what's going on, but if you can't read them, I'll tell you. Uh, this particular voxel gives a positive bold response whenever you show any kind of vehicle or any kind of artifact that you can pick up or any indoor scenes or outdoor scenes or people or canines. And it tends to be suppressed by uh, other kinds of animals that aren't canines, by atmospheric phenomena, and by plants. Okay, now here's a separate voxel in the right precuneus. This voxel uh, gives a positive bold response when you show people, or communication verbs, or carnivores, uh, or vehicles, or things you can pick up. And it gives a negative bold response as it was suppressed by a lot of other kinds of artifacts, outdoor scenes, indoor scenes, uh, plants, atmospheric phenomena, traveling verbs, ungulates, which it doesn't like, um, and so on. So you can see these data are pretty damn complicated, right? Really, we've done uh, a whole thousands of functional localizer scans in one experiment here. And we can't interpret this data by going through all the individual voxels because we've got 30,000 voxels. That would be absolutely crazy. Really, what we have is 30,000 voxels, a matrix of 30,000 voxels by 1,700 nouns and verbs. We've got a weight matrix. And we have to interpret that. How the heck do we do that? Well, as engineers always know, given a big matrix that you need to interpret, the very first thing you do is PCA. So let's do PCA on this matrix and see what happens. Okay, so we did PCA on this matrix. And uh, we're going to get out, of course, 1,700 principal components. Let's just look at the first few. They're probably going to be the only ones that matter. 
Um, and let's look at it for several subjects. So here's we've got subject SN, AH, and, and uh, AV. This is three subjects. We've got five subjects who've done this experiment. They all show the same result. These are not the PCs. These are the correlations between the PCs. You can see that all these subjects show very strong correlations between the first four principal components of this semantic space. So that's good. That means we're no longer in random world where everybody's got some hopelessly complicated semantic thing we'll never understand. Now we see that all subjects share four principal components and we have some hope of actually interpreting that. So the first thing you want to do though is make sure this isn't a stimulus artifact. So we need to compare the stimulus, to correlate the principal components with the stimulus PCs. You can see that only one of the principal components correlates with the stimulus PCs. And so well, let's not worry about that. It looks like it's not much of a problem. So now that we know that all subjects share the same semantic space, we can actually aggregate all the data together, do PCA on the data aggregated across subjects, extract one principal component space for all the subjects, and then project each individual person's data into that principal component space. And that's what we did here. You can see it works pretty well. Okay. Now we've done dimensionality reduction. The next stage is to visualize the data. Now remember the matrix this weight matrix maps between the feature space and the brain space. So to interpret the weight matrix, we can either look at the feature space or the brain space. Let's project into the feature space first. So this is the feature space. There's, this is a four-dimensional space. Of course, we can't plot four dimensions on a, on a three-dimensional, on a two-dimensional surface. So let's pull out the first PC because it's probably boring. And in fact, the first PC is boring. The first PC is always boring in any problem. It's energy. Bright, fast-moving things versus slow, dark-moving things. Of course, bright, fast-moving things make more neurons fire, and that makes more bold signal. And so you'd expect that that would be the first PC. Let's ignore that. Now we'll take the other three PCs, and we'll color code them. So we can take each individual feature and color code it in this three PC space and map the individual features back on the WordNet tree. Now, if you don't really understand where the heck this came from at this point, and I wouldn't blame you if that was true, really all you need to know is similar colors on this map are semantic concepts that are represented similarly in all human brains. So all these yellow things here are animals. And they're all represented similarly. People are all represented similarly. These are all uh, indoor and outdoor scenes. Uh, well, indoor scenes, they're all represented similarly. These are all vehicles, they're all represented similarly. Uh, these are um, communication verbs, they're all represented similarly. There's a lot of data in here. And of course, this is a three-dimensional structure, so it might be a little easier to look at a movie of it. Um, now remember, there's 1,700 colors here. I've just included a little cheat sheet of 16 colors here so you can kind of see what's going on. I'll kind of walk you through this. This uh, flat yellow thing here is animals. It's kind of on a branch off by itself. Um, this green thing here is uh, uh, people. Um, this stick that's sticking out here, completely different from everything else, this turns out to be uh, atmospheric phenomena. And this little ball that's sticking out all by itself turns out to be text. They're different from everything else. Um, this purple stuff down here is vehicles. These blue things are indoor scenes. Now there's some weird things in here. You notice there's this little red ball here that kind of seems off by itself. It's hanging off of humans, but it's kind of out here, and it looks like it's reaching toward this little ball here. This little red ball turns out to be athletes. Athletes are kind of represented differently from humans because these were a long view of athletes, so they're in a kind of athlete context, which is different than the normal human context. And then this little ball here, you wonder what this is. It's kind of reaching down towards athletes. This turns out to be talking animals because in these movies, we had cartoons, and even though there was no sound, the animals were making talking motions. And so when your brain sees a talking animal, it says, well, what the heck is this? Is that an animal? Is it an athlete? I'm not really sure. So it kind of, anyway, all right. So there's a lot of data in here, okay? Uh, now you can also take this matrix and you project it onto the flat maps. And this tells you where semantic concepts are uh, reflected on this or organized on the surface of the brain. So I'm, for some reason I showed a left hemisphere here. Uh, here's the visual system at the back. Remember the structural areas are, are here on the, on the far right and these are the semantic areas. And this is uh, somatosens somatosensory and motor. Uh, this is speech down here. You can see that these, um, Semantic selectivity is, is widely distributed across the entire surface of the cortex here. Now, remember, these are all vectors I'm plotting. So the vectors have two components. They have a length and a direction. And here I'm only plotting the direction. So I'm not showing you how much of the variance in the voxels' responses these uh, semantic selectivity vectors account for. I'm just showing you what the tuning is toward. 
And the main thing to take away from this is it's not like there's individual islands of semantic selectivity that are organized for sp certain specific semantic categories like faces and places. Instead, there are these broad gradients of semantic selectivity that spread across cortex. This is humans and animals. Uh, this is uh, uh, indoor scenes, motion. Vehicles are here back in the structural areas, but I think that's because although we tried to remove all the motion energy from this model before we project it onto the surface of cortex, um, the vehicles still have some residual motion energy that we couldn't completely remove. So this is a fairly complicated map, and now the problem is, as David pointed out, although subjects in some sense have a similar semantic space, it turns out if you look across subjects, the details of every single subject's map are different. And aggregating those subjects into a common map space turns out to be an interesting, challenging problem. Now, uh, one thing that people oftentimes ask me is, well, okay, this, people aren't doing anything in this task. They're just staring at a dot and they're ignoring the movies. What happens if they pay attention to the movies? That's a legitimate question. After all, if you, uh, if you record in neurophysiology, even as far back in V4, when an animal searches for pattern A versus pattern B, you'll see changes in the gain of the neurons, you'll see changes in the baseline response, you'll see changes in the tuning of the neurons back in V4. They're not huge changes in tuning, they're about 10%, but they are there. If you go to the frontal cortex, uh, Earl Miller's lab has shown that neurons can completely change their tuning depending on what the animal's looking for. So can we see that kind of effect in humans? To do this, we did a simple task. Instead of having people just stare at the movies, we had them stare at the dot while searching for something. In task one, search for humans. Whenever you see a human, hold down the button, and when there's no human, release it. And in task two, search for vehicles. Whenever you see a vehicle, hold down the button, and when you don't, release it. Simple task. Now we fit two models, one under searching for humans and one under searching for vehicles. So we can look at an, the exact same voxel under these two situations. Here's a voxel in the sorry, the fusiform face area. You can see when, when you search for humans, this voxel is mostly tuned for humans. And also animals, they have faces too. Uh, but really, the person was searching for humans here, and this voxel mostly responds to humans. But when you ask the person to search for vehicles, although the voxel retains its human tuning, it now all of a sudden sort of lifts up its leg and expands its tuning curve to also include vehicles and objects in a similar sort of semantic space from vehicles. So these voxel, this voxel is shifting its tuning curve depending on what you look for. You can average across all the voxels in the brain for, while searching for humans versus searching for vehicles, and then you can just subtract the models for all the voxels. And you can see when you're searching for humans, essentially tuning for humans increases. And when you're searching for vehicles, tuning for vehicles increases. And if you want to know where this happens in the brain, you can just plot this black on the flat maps of the brain. So this is a really complicated color map that I hate, but I've never figured out anything better. Uh, the way to think about it is basically red means the voxel shifted towards uh, humans, and green means the voxel shifted towards vehicles. And I'm just showing you the situation when you're searching for humans and searching for vehicles. And what you can see is the shifts are enormously, uh, sorry, the shifts are distributed all over the cortex, right? They're everywhere, and in fact, Structural part of cortex, early retinotopic cortex, does not shift all that much. Most of the shifts occur in these uh, semantic areas, higher order uh, visual system, but also up here in frontal cortex. You see a lot of substantial shifts up here. So this is a very widespread phenomenon. And the way I like to think about it is, it's, it's, think of your brain like a computer farm, except it's not like Amazon Cloud where any computer can do anything. Instead, there are sort of sub-farms in this computer farm. There's a, a bank of computers that's done, used for vision, there's a bank of computers that's used for audition, and there's a bank of computers that's used for somatic sensation, and those are kind of fixed. But then you've got this more general, like Amazon Cloud, that's your general purpose computer farm, and that's going to do whatever you need to do at any point in time. So if, you, if searching for humans is what your job is, then your whole brain, most of the front of it, becomes a giant human detector. Now, one thing you might ask is, well, wait a minute, maybe this is just an artifact. After all, the bold response is a blood flow response, and blood flow is related to blood pressure, and blood pressure is related to arousal. So maybe what happens is when people detect humans in the displays, they get excited. They say, I detected the human. They hit the button. Their blood pressure goes up. Bold goes up. And then when we do regression, it looks like Tuning got shifted to humans, even though it was just blood pressure, which would be the most boring thing possible. So how do we get around that? Well, it's really easy in this task. We actually just go through the movies, and we remove all the cases where humans or vehicles ever appeared. So now there's no humans or vehicles. They never make a positive response. But we can look at the tuning of all the voxels for anything that's not humans or vehicles. And because we have this semantic space, we can look to see if the tuning of all the non-humans and vehicles 
voxels shifts towards the location in semantic space where humans and vehicles are located, even though there are no humans and vehicles in the task. And uh, that's what this shows in a kind of arcane way. Basically, you get shifts predominantly over toward the direction of the attended target. So this does not need the targets present. In fact, I think this is the only MRI experiment anybody's ever done where you could do this, uh, where you could show an attention effect without the targets being present. And that was, that was probably not related to blood pressure. So if we just collapse over humans and vehicles, um, you see that red here means the tuning shifted toward the target, and blue means the tuning shifted away from the target. And you notice in most parts of the brain, it looks like tuning shifted toward the target. It's kind of like your brain is acting like a matched filter. If you're searching for dogs, your brain says, well, okay, I'm gonna try to basically increase the representational space for dogs at the cost of representing other things because they're not important. And I'm gonna be able to represent dogs with more resolution and more fidelity and it's got more hardware and so everything's gonna get better and you're gonna do better at your dog detection task. There are a few places, however, that don't actually shift toward the attended target, they shift away. The TPJ, this area in frontal cortex, and this thing up in the precuneus. And those are three very interesting areas because those turn out to be part of the default network and they're part of supposedly self-awareness part of the brain. So our current theory about this is that essentially uh, when you're doing an external detection task, a search task, it's very important for you not to get confused between events happening in the external world and your fantasies of what you'd like to see in the external world. So actually, the parts of the brain that monitor your internal state actually shift away so that they're more, less likely to interfere with the targets. Now in the last few minutes, oh, uh, yeah, this is all going to be online. If you're curious about this, there's a lot of data in here. So we're building a little tool that will enable you to basically go in and just click any point in the brain and pull up its uh, semantic tuning and its structural tuning and actually other kinds of tuning that we have. And then you can uh, sort of just steer the brain around. So here I'm looking at the front and sh this front part of the brain. It's non-visual. It's still tuned for uh, people, it looks like. Here's a location in FFA. It's tuned for people. And if I go to a different place in FFA, uh, it turns out it's not really tuned for people. It's tuned for text. I go over to PPA here, and this is tuned for uh, vehicles and, and uh, objects and so on. So this, uh, this little tool will be online. Anybody can just go in and, and run it. It's a pretty neat tool to play with. Okay, now in the last few minutes, last five minutes, I'd like to talk about decoding, which is probably what a lot of you are here for. Uh, you may wonder why, I thought he was a decoder. Why did he spend the whole day talking about this weird neuroscience encoding stuff? And the reason is, uh, I think if you want to do decoding, the best thing to do is build an encoding model rather than just try to decode blindly. If you try to decode blindly, you've, you're basically in the machine learning world where it's all, the, the quality of your decoder is gonna depend on how much data you have. In this business, you're never gonna get enough data. But if you build an encoding model and then turn it into a decoder, then you can leverage all the information we have about neuroscience and about the way the brain works to build your encoding model, and then you get decoding out of it for free. So obviously, if you could build a decoder, you could do a lot of things with it. You could control wheelchairs or, or pinball machines, which would be awesome, I think. Or uh, you could build a speller. All these systems use NERS or EEG. NERS or EEG are, well, actually, I think this is also an EEG system. These are all EEG systems. EEG is not a very good way to measure brain activity. And you're only going to get you know, a couple bits out of EEG. If you want to build a good brain decoder, you're going to have to use MRI or the portable version of MRI, which is going to be NERS dot or something like it. So uh, this is a refresher for what I talked about before. We've got a stimulus and some brain activity build an encoding model, which gives us the probability of the response given some function of the stimulus. And now to do decoding, we take this likelihood, we multiply it times a prior, and we get a posterior. No problem. It's simple, trivial math, except for one thing. We don't know this, P of S. We don't have a prior on natural movies. And this is a problem of computer vision again. Computer vision people have not solved the prior on natural movies, so we, we don't really have a P of S to use. So what do we use? Well, in our lab, we basically use what's known as an empirical prior. We just sample a large number of images or movies. So if we're decoding images, we have 50 million images we downloaded from Flickr, and we use those. If we're decoding movies, we have 5,000 hours of video we downloaded at random from YouTube. Google hates us for this because it took us six months and they do not like you doing it. Um, but we have this 5,000 hours of video that we can use for a decoder and so on. So, we're gonna, so basically we're gonna decode in terms of these libraries and our quality of decoding is gonna be limited by the size of our libraries. So this is the first paper we published back in 2008. Um, on the top are three images we showed. On the bottom are the three reconstructions from our Flickr database. Remember these images were not in the database so we could not actually find the actual image you saw. 
So here you notice there's a harbor scene, here's a harbor scene, here's a bunch of people with a room, in a room, here's a bunch of people in a room with their hands up, here's two buildings in the front, one in the back, here's two buildings in the front, one in the back. Well, this is a coliseum, it's kind of a building. Um, you notice the contrast is lost here because, of course, we're measuring MRI and we lose contrast information because the visual system codes luminance is above the mean and luminance is below the mean in two different channels and those get aggregated together in the bold signal. So we don't have contrast. But these reconstructions are quite good and if we had, say, 50 billion images instead of 50 million images, we'd stand a really good chance of finding an image that was very close to the exact one that you saw. Um, this is a different, oh, you might think, okay, well, you can decode actual images that you showed, so maybe you could decode something like visual imagery. Is that possible? Well, Thomas Nasolaris in my lab did an experiment where for a week, he just stared at these four images. He'd just sit at his desk and stare at the Mona Lisa for hours, trying to make the perfect internal image of the Mona Lisa. And then he went into the magnet, and we just put up a little word, Mona Lisa, and he had to, like, make an, a mental image of the Mona Lisa, and now we pretend that this is the same data we had before, and we shove it through the regular model, and we see what we get. And that's here, so the Mona Lisa becomes <laughs> Salma Hayek, and the soldier becomes a horse, and the kitty becomes a dog, I think, and the vegetables are vegetables. So, so this actually works pretty well, and the really cool thing about this is, remember, this is the wrong model. You know this is the wrong model, because your brain must do something different when you're looking at an actual image versus when you're doing visual imagery. Because if your brain did exactly the same thing in those two cases, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, and you'd probably walk in front of a car or something. So it's the wrong model, but it still kind of works. Okay, I'm just going to take you through a few other models. This is a model that uh, leverages some intermediate visual arrays that have both structural and semantic information. So we set this decoder up to be, uh, you query it. You can basically ask it four questions. Where are the animals? Where are the man-made objects? Where are the people? Where are the plants? And it just returns these pink squares. It doesn't know anything about the image. And then you overlay the image to see if you got it right. So here it finds the swan. Here it finds these buildings. Here it finds the people. And here it finds the office plant. So, so that kind of works. That's nice. Um, Oh, this is an interesting decoder that uh, uses latent Dirichlet allocation. This is a, a machine, a, a, a decoder where the underlying feature space was learned using machine learning, and we never uh, implemented it directly by hand. But then we fit it to people's brains. And to take a long story short, this decoder essentially returns a probability that uh, a scene belongs to certain scene categories, and it returns the probability of objects. So you see there's this land, it thinks, this is a guy with a spider on his face, it thinks, I think this is land animals and few people and maybe food, I'm not sure, and there's a man and maybe a woman and a person and a head and it's an animal. And here it gets a sports scene, it says there's a sporting event and some large crowds and few people, and I think there's an athlete and some people and a man. You can see in all these cases it's doing really, really well. Uh, so, many of you have probably seen this. This was uh, our structural decoder using the motion energy model. This was on YouTube last uh, fall and was very popular. Um, on the upper left here, we have the movie that we actually showed someone. Now, when we decode, remember, we're not just decoding into one image. We're getting a posterior distribution over all 5,000 hours of video. So, each one second of these 18 million seconds of video has a certain probability. Here I'm showing the 15 most likely clips in the posterior, and when the image has a face, then all of the clips in the posterior look kind of face-like. But when the image is something really abstract that there's, and there's nothing like it in YouTube, then all the clips that we have over here in the posterior are really bad. So in that case, we just average over the top 100 and we show this here. So this is called the maximum a posterior solution up here, and this is the average high posterior solution down here. And these are both valid decoding results. You can use whichever one you want. Now, I'm kind of bored with this. It's like a three-year-old result now. I don't really want to look at it anymore. So the thing that's really cool that I like is when we use the semantic model to decode the semantic concepts from these exact same data. And that's shown here. So we're decoding 1,700 nouns and verbs simultaneously from people's brains. And I've just, I'm outlining the, uh, I've arrayed them on a two-dimensional surface here just so they don't all overlap each other. The size here refers to the probability that that thing was happening in the movie at any given time. So you can see that here it gets uh, hand, man, woman, talk, dog. You may notice came up a little early, but there's, there was the dog. Um, the timing's a little bit off right, right now. It's, it's pulling up things a bit early. This is kind of a really short, mixed-up scene, but then it kind of settles down. Clouds, body of water, mountain. Here's some buildings, sky vegetation, uh, you see people here, road, walk, and then in just a second it will change. You see here's some women, so then we change, we get text for the text here, 
Then talk, woman, man, the man will come up in a second. There he is, room. Your brain isn't actually predicting, we just haven't adjusted the time right. It's not, you can't see into the future with this device. Um, flower, and then we switch to underwater here, body of water, fish, uh, water, swim. It's not perfect, you know, we don't have a manatee, so it thinks it's a whale. Well, okay, that's an honest mistake. You know, it's, in general, this thing works amazingly well. It's really quite impressive because, again, we're not really optimizing these decoding models. We optimize our encoding model. Our decoder, we're just kind of getting just by implementing Bayes' theorem. It's not really any magic at all. Oh, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this. This is decoding navigation. So, um, so where are we now? Well, um, I like to think of this as the beginning of photography. So this is the very first photograph that was ever taken by Joseph Nietzsche in the south of France in like 1825 uh, or 1882, or I can't really remember, a long time ago, almost 200 years ago. And, um, and it's a lousy photograph, but you can still tell it's not random. It's not white noise, right? It looks like maybe there's a building, maybe this is a roof, and this is maybe the side of a barn. This is maybe another building here. Uh, this may be a building here. Maybe it looks like there's a, a horizon here. This is probably the sky. You can kind of tell what this is. And, you know, between this very first photograph and today, now we have so much resolution and so many pixels and such high quality video that people actually don't even want to pay for it. It's not even worth it anymore. So video is kind of a solved problem. Um, in this case, brain reading and our ability to decode brain activity, it's all contingent on the quality of brain activity measurements that we can make. And right now, there's a limit by MRI. And the quality of models that we have, and those are very, very coarse. And the quality of computers, which is still fairly slow, although, of course, that doubles every few years. So you can bet that brain decoding technology is going to advance really, really rapidly, especially once we have better, better measures for measuring brain activity. And uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. So um, I guess when your grad student was making the model in the first place, um, I'm just wondering like the biases that he has when he's making the model for like grouping things together, like across cultures, does that change at all? Because if you introduce someone from say like Africa or something and they've never seen some of those things in the images before, how does your model account for that? Or can so uh, the word net was not done by my graduate student. That was actually done by this uh, group of linguists and psychologists at Princeton. It's been worked on for 20 years. So WordNet's kind of just a given English language you know, taxonomy of words. The bias part came in when my graduate student decided to code things in the movies. And in that case, you know, nobody wants to go through and code every single thing, so he picked the salient things. And there could have been some bias that was introduced at that stage. But that's going to be a bias of omission, meaning there was just a bunch of things he didn't code at all, so we couldn't represent them in the encoding model. We couldn't account for the part of the variance in the brain that relates to the things that weren't encoded, and we can't decode them. As far as the cultural issue, I feel pretty confident that at least for people who uh, come from an industrial society, it doesn't matter because one of our subjects was born in Japan and just came here a couple years ago. One of our subjects was born in Sweden and moved here as a child. One of our subjects was born in Korea and uh, one of our subjects was born in Russia, and one of our subjects was born in America. So we've got pretty much the whole spectrum of industrialized countries in the lab, and those are the, our people, or the actual subjects here. So I would assume that this will generalize to any group of smart Berkeley graduate students. <laughs> yes? You are examining here only things that are actually seen, but that's the way is things that can be inferred from the people. And I presume that this would be a very interesting talk for you, whether you can determine whether people have inferred some, something. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's because that's not just imagery, that's like making inferences about the world, that's sort of having a narrative, constructing a narrative of what's going on. So have you tried anything of that sort? You know? we, haven't for, we haven't for vision. Uh, movies are really a giant pain in the rear end to work with because you have to code everything by hand. So to get at this issue, it's actually easier to use speech. So we have a whole other part of the brain lab that I haven't talked about because nobody's ever presented at a meeting yet uh, on language decoding where we fit uh, various sorts of language model to uh, just corpuses of normal speech and these issues then, then come out in, in that kind of uh, data. I think, I think your, your intuition is correct. You can essentially, this is a completely open modeling frame where you can model anything you want. If you decide to make a set of regressors that have to do with inferences about the scenes rather than the scenes, you're perfectly entitled to do that. And, uh, and, and that's a, 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 an avenue we're pursuing in various ways. Yes? Um, how big a 
that's the sample you have. I mean, um, so how, how many subjects did you cast? So uh, in my, I, um, since my background is both in human psychophysics and single cell physiology in animals, I tend to be a low end kind of person. I want to get as much data as I can from a few people rather than getting a lot of data, sorry, a little tiny data from a lot of people. So all the experiments in my lab are generally small and experiments. The, this experiment with movies, I think we've got a total of seven subjects now that have, that have watched these movies and for which we've built models. Um, and each individual subject is modeled individually. There's no aggregation that ever goes on. So at the, these, these 30,000 models you have to, build have, have to build have to be built for each individual person. Now, uh, the idea of aggregating across humans uh, and pooling the data together is really, you know, really important for understanding things. And uh, I kind of showed you one way to do that, which is to just aggregate the weights and take the principal components and see if there's anything in common. But that's not really satisfactory because ultimately what you're going to want is to take this functional data and link it to David's connectivity data. And so that means you have to have a way to basically map the individual people, either get the connectivity for the individual people or map the individual people back into the canonical space. And that's, um, you know, as David pointed out, that's a challenge. And the government doesn't pay me very much money to solve that challenge, so I'm hoping someone else will do it first. All right, I think we need to get ready for the tours, but let's thank Professor Allen again. For the